Hi, in this video I will be attempting to solve the five day two puzzles of the Galactic Puzzle Hunt 2017. There is obviously a spoiler alert for all these puzzles as the answers will be revealed, and if you would like to skip ahead to a specific puzzle, the timestamps are in the video description. So the Galactic Puzzle Hunt is by the name of the team that made it is right here, and you are supposed to pronounce the emojis at the beginning and end. And I don't remember exactly how, and I can't find a video of anybody doing it. I want to say it's like a race car noise, it's like vroom. But for now, I'll just call them Galactic Transitors. So I have was on a team solving the MIT Mystery Hunt the last several years, and I did participate in the Galactic Puzzle Hunt 2018 and 2019. I didn't participate in this one when it was around. So I definitely liked the 2018-2019 Galactic Puzzle Hunts, so I've always wanted to come back to this one. And since I made the day one video about a year ago, something has happened, which is that the Team Galactic Trendsetters won the 2020 MIT Mystery Hunt. So if you're not familiar with it, what that means is they will be writing the 2021 MIT Mystery Hunt, which unfortunately means they're not going to be able to put on a Galactic Puzzle Hunt 2020 because they'll be busy writing next year's Mystery Hunt. But it does mean that going back to these Galactic Puzzle Hunts might be good preparation for 2021 MIT Mystery Hunt. We'll see. Okay, after the last video, I realized I need a solving protocol, so I went ahead and wrote one out. This is just what will happen if I get stuck. I'll only go into it when I actually do get stuck, which hopefully won't be right away. Okay, day two, puzzle one. What do you do? Start the timer. Okay. So it looks like we've got a number of images of fictional characters and a set of words. As before, there's no flavor text, so the first step is probably just to identify who these characters are. So a lot of these are from animes that I have not seen, um, or other shows that I haven't seen, so I'm just doing a Google image search for them. I am noticing that the characters so far are mostly in alphabetical order. Okay, 12 characters in, I'm pretty sure, alphabetical order. 12 words. Obviously, a good idea is to try to match up the words with the characters. A few of the characters have very short names. Let's try writing out the, the shortest version of their name that we can think of. Make sure that we keep it in alphabetical order. All right, I'm about 50-50 on this being a real thing, but Kipper is a kind of fish. And holster is another word for sheave. Anger, rage, elder, senior. Okay, so this has got to be something. But some of these are not obvious to me yet. Torture? Torture! Oh, I had to say it out loud. Um, Okay. Torture can be pain. Yeah. All right. Cool. Year. Year. Time. So mayor. Mayor politician. Okay. Cool. All right. Great. So I, I think I should be able to match up almost all of these. Okay. Looks like they all match up pretty well. Sorting everything by the order of the words. Don't see anything there. Pahawk. Okay, now I see it. PA hockey team. Possibly that's the answer, but let's see what that gives us. Oh boy. Professionalized hockey teams in Pennsylvania. Okay, well, I certainly do not know. Pennsylvania hockey teams that well, but looking at this list, I'm guessing it's going to be either Philadelphia or Pittsburgh. So I think that the, the gist of this puzzle is you ask the word fade, what do you do? And fade is like, oh, I'm a Peter. And you ask the word rage, what do you do? And you're like, oh, I'm an anger. So I think that what we want is one of these ice hockey teams that ends in er, either otters or flyers. And since flyers is from Philadelphia, I'm gonna guess that's what we should be thinking of. I'm not sure 
what that means the answer is though. Does that mean the answer is flyers or is it fly um, or something else? I could just try every answer that I can think of, but I do want to try to get this in as few guesses as possible. So I think, thinking it through, that the most likely answer they would have used in this case is fly because then you're sort of undoing what you've done throughout the puzzle. All right, let's try fly first and then flyers. Okay, fly is incorrect. Okay, great, solved, the answer was flyers. Only took two guesses, that's not too bad. Stop the timer. What do you do by Ben Yang? I thought this was well done. It's interesting that they have the author's notes down here. And I thought this was cool that they said that the basic idea of the puzzle came from the fact that if you take flow and add ER, you get flower. Um, but they didn't go quite that direction in this puzzle. They went with homophones instead of homonyms. And I'm glad they did because for me, it was kind of a fun moment to realize what was going on as I said it out loud. I don't know if I would have got it as fast if I wasn't recording a video. So I thought this one was pretty easy, but it had the same number of solves, or almost the same number of solves as zero space, which was a mighty puzzle. So I'm gonna have to keep that in mind that these solve rates are gonna drop off quite a bit as we go further into the puzzle event. Day two, puzzle two, the Super Bowl. Once upon a time, I decided to watch the Super Bowl. Okay. All right, so. Looks like we've got some text to read. Okay, the narrative here is barely coherent. I don't think the overall story matters, but there are a lot of references to things that seem very specific. A bunch of Zulu infantry, emblem of the beehive state, low frame rate pictures. All right, let's try to figure out what some of these are referring to. I don't really see any relationship between the answers I'm getting out either. So something about the words in this makes me feel like, makes me feel like I'll need to look at two things that are in close proximity to each other. It's not just gonna be breaks at a very high temperature. It's whenever you take a picture, it breaks at a very high temperature. Somehow these two concepts are gonna be used together. So like photo shatter, I guess is not a thing like an old explosive boat. So fire ship shoots into the pelvis. F fires hip. Oh wait, fire ship fires hip. Okay, wait, hang on. A caper involving the script. Antic line. Arch like geological folds, anticline. Antic lines, anticlines. Okay, okay. All right, what else we got? Trixie impish, bunch of Zulu infantry impy. Quiet, shh. Okay. So I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess that this title is a clue as to what we're supposed to do. So Super Bowl is a compound word made of super and bowl. But if you split it up incorrectly, you can make a different compound word, superb and owl. So similarly in this case, uh, get away is a compound word, but if you split it up incorrectly, you can spell get away. So we'll be looking for compound words in all of these that we can break into other pieces. All right, this is working out pretty well so far. I realize that the one word clue can come in first or the two word clue can come in first, either way. One thing I didn't realize at first, the two word answer does not semantically mean anything that's in the paragraph. Like MIT mascot is Tim, passes is elapses, but Tim elapses is not the same thing as the MIT mascot catching some of the passes. Parent for obvious, that's not a compound word. Overt, overt would be a good beginning. Oh, 
over tax. It's close. Too great of a demand could be over taxing, cutting would need to be X or axing. I think that makes the most sense. Overt, axing, overtaxing. War for battle. Is there anything where we can make a warp? Teleportation technology. Warp. Warplane. War. Battle aircraft, warplane. Teleportation. Warp. Road. Lane. Got it. Great. This almost looks like associate. I'm reading on the right here, A-S-S-O-C-I, then A-T-E. Okay, I see what it is. Like in this one, get is on the left half, away is on the right half. In this one, the A moves from the right half to the left half. So the A is the letter that moves here, S moves here, uh, and so on, until you get to here, in this case, the A moves from the left half to the right half. So in each case, we want the letter that changes sides. So it's a little weird because impish is not really a compound word. In ish is just a suffix. But I think that we can say that imp is the left half and ish is the right half in this word. All right, this looks pretty likely to be associated press. Let's try to get at least one of the two missing letters, just to confirm. And there's a bunch of likely clue words in here. Seriously, physically, mentally, risk, final, quarter, clearly, madness. End, angerment, lack of safety, endangerment, final, end, madness, angerment? Is that a word? Oh, no, it doesn't need to be. In danger. And anger. Yeah, okay. Okay, we've only got one left. I'll try for a few minutes, then give up. So again, we're looking for an S, so we want either the second or third clue word has to start with an S, or the one before it, the other half of the clue, ends with an S. Pause. Catastrophic, catastrophic, blinds, sash. So window, window covering could be blinds. Rudely surprises could be blindsided. Blindsides, blindsides, blinds, ides. Ides could be unlucky day. I mean, yeah, I know the literal meaning of ides. I know about Julius Caesar. I've never heard it used figuratively to mean an unlucky day, but it would totally make sense. All right, let's go with that. Okay, looks good. Associated press, let's see. Associated press. All right, great. Let's stop the timer there. Okay, The Superb Owl by Louis Chen. I thought this was a cute idea. And I like that the title references it. I was familiar with the superb owl joke, but I think that even if you weren't, you'd be able to pick it up once you saw what was going on. It looks like I got most of the clues, but there was one that I wasn't sure of. Unlucky day, meaning Ides. Um, I'm pleased to see that there was another clue there. You could also use today, and since this was released on the Ides of March, that could also clue Ides. We saw that in Puzzle of the Day earlier on day one. We need to remember what day these were released on. The author's note for this puzzle is really good. He goes into a lot of detail about the challenges he found, and some of the things that I thought were a little iffy, like they weren't all compound words, he specifically says that that was because it was such a difficult construction. Yeah, so given the challenges of the construction here, I think it was pretty well made. So I could have saved 26 minutes here because I knew that the answer was Associated Press before I got the last two letters. I don't know. When I'm making these videos, it's kind of nice to finish the solution if it's not going to take too much extra time. But 
that's not how you would do it during a regular puzzle hunt, and it's definitely going to affect the solve time. So, what do you think? Should I have submitted it as soon as I knew the answer, or kept going to the end? So, I would say for the most part, this does read like a logic puzzle. It seems like there is a solution to this. But, there's a few things in here that are kind of weird. Here it says exactly one person lives in each house. And here it says only Abby lives in the black house. So I'm going to go ahead and approach it still like a logic puzzle, but expect there to be something else going on. At least 11 non-gray roses and at least two gray roses. So that means at least 13. There's an even number of roses, so at least 14. Okay, a black rose is surrounded by roses that share a color. And the only roses that share a color are gray. So that means a black rose has to be between two grays. So one possibility is we have black here. So this seven be gray, six be black, five be gray. Um, what about other possibilities? We could not do it on the other side, gray, black, gray, because of the clue that says all roses in the right half of the row appear only once in the row. So we can't have two grays in the right half. Now four roses lie between two gray roses. I'm going to guess that we, could, we can't have 9 be gray and have it go from 5 to 9. Well, I guess we could. So either 9 or 11 is gray, certainly. Oh shoot, I messed this up. Four roses lie between two gray roses. So, okay, so there's another possibility here. No, we can't have a gray in 12, because green, yellow, white needs to be to the right of orange. But we could have it in 10. Okay, I think this is the only possibility. So it's interesting that all of the colors appear in this, uh, this color palette for Apple Macintosh. The ones that don't appear are dark green and tan. And interestingly, there's three different shades of gray here. And we, and we had three gray roses. Okay, I think we're going to need to solve the houses and fruit together at the same time. Because there's some clues in the fruit that reference the house colors. But it's still not completely clear how the houses are laid out. Um, but there are cert it certainly can't just be in a straight line like the roses are. Like here it says that the red house has th at least three neighbors. So I'm going to assume that it's two rows of six and ones that are across the street from each other are counted as neighbors. But when it says opposite side, that means they have to be across the street from each other. And when it says next to, that means the same side of the street. Hopefully I'll be able to figure out pretty quickly that this is wrong, if it actually is wrong. Okay, this does seem impossible. A greenhouse is next to a cyan house. Gray and cyan houses appear next to each other. So the two houses next to a cyan house must be green and gray. Abby lives next to the cyan house which means Abby's house must be green or gray. However, it says here, Abby lives in the black house. So we've got an inconsistency. Um, so either my understanding of how it's laid out is wrong or what some of these words mean next to could mean across the street from. Okay, I think this is probably it. The There are three different ways that they refer to houses being near to each other adjacent, next to, and neighbors. And they're not defined anywhere in here. Um, but I was able to figure out a solution assuming that adjacent means on the same side of the street. Um, next to can mean adjacent to or across the street from each other. And neighbors means um, any of the five that are next to or diagonal. So like for instance, when it says Freya is neighbors with Howard and Thomas, they're diagonal. And when it says gray and cyan houses appear next to each other, that's horizontal. There seem to be more clues than were necessary. Sometimes they were telling me things that I already knew. And I wonder if 
that was because they were giving redundancy so you could figure out what these words mean in addition to the actual solution. So normally those redundancies would make me a little wary, but the fact that you had to figure these out, um, maybe it means it's just what you were supposed to do. Oh no, I must have been wrong somewhere. Getting to the fruit part, it says the person who has the kiwis lives next to the cyan house and next to Elizabeth. And there's nobody I have on this chart who lives next to both of them. So I must have these definitions wrong. Okay, I can't prove it, but I don't think it works the way that I was imagining with a street with six houses on each side. So I'm trying to figure out what the layout would be. I wrote down all of the relationships between two houses or two people. And the one that seemed the most uh, descriptive is someone lives on the opposite side from someone else. And for houses that certainly seem to suggest a street that people can live on opposite sides from one another. But I'm wondering what else this could possibly mean. It doesn't mention a street anywhere in here. Um, I was thinking, especially because the flavor text says the surfaces of the planet, uh, makes me think it's going to be some exotic shape. I was thinking like a Mobius strip, but that doesn't really make sense with this, I think. Um, one thing that I can imagine it being is a three-dimensional solid with 12 surfaces. And the obvious idea for that is a dodecahedron. It does suggest that one person has five neighbors, which would be a pretty good match for the dodecahedron. But there's not really anything else that suggests something like that, so I'm a little suspicious of it, but might as well give it a shot. Okay, it's uh, doing it through the spreadsheet. It's gonna be a little bit confusing keeping track of which sides are adjacent to which, but I think it should be pretty clear. Every side is adjacent to five other sides and it's whatever is next to so this one is clearly adjacent to this one, this one, and this one. But also anything that's next to A, which is these two, and, and anything that's next to C, which is this one. I think I should be able to keep it straight. Um, but we'll see. I guess the one that really makes me question this is you can see the magenta house from the brown house. Because if these were on a three-dimensional surface, what would it mean that you can see one from the other? It's not very unambiguous. This made definitely made more sense when it was in a row on a street. You know, there's going to be a mirror asymmetry here. So that means that I can arbitrarily pick one of these two spots for Freya to be in, and that's going to determine the rest of them. Okay, so with a dodecahedron, for every surface it has five neighbors, and then it has five more surfaces on the back side that are not its neighbors, and then it has one more on the opposite side. Let's see, so Howard is next to the grapes, which means if this side is Howard, then one of the five nearby ones has to be the grapes. And we know that the grapes are opposite from the red house. And the red house would then have to be on one of the five back faces. So if Howard is here, that means it has to be in one of these five surfaces. All right, so Stuart is opposite Howard, and so one of these five. Only three of them are still available. Abby and Charles are already taken. And we also know that the red house where Ophelia lives needs to be adjacent to Thomas. And there's only one possibility that I can see, which is that Thomas is here and Ophelia is here. Let's try that. Now we know where the grapes are. Still going, I'm not quite done, but I am surprised at how far I've made it without hitting a contradiction yet. I think this might be right. So I'm gonna step through each of the clues 
each of the constraints and make sure that it's actually satisfied by the solution. For Abby shares a picket fence with Charles, I'm assuming that means Abby is adjacent to Charles. For Charles and Freya are good friends, I assume they need to be adjacent. Elizabeth and Freya like to shout, so I assume they have to be adjacent as well. If you lived in the Magenta house, Ophelia would be your neighbor, okay? Stuart refuses to have anything to do with Howard or Howard's neighbors. It turned out that Stuart was actually on the complete opposite side as Howard, so that's definitely true. Red house, neighbors, the gray house, the cyan house, the house Philip lives in, the orange house, the house Thomas lives in. So one nice sign is that that is now referring to five different houses, whereas before I was double counting that I had Thomas in the orange house. So I like that. You can see the magenta house from the brown house. I assume that means they have to be adjacent, but again, that clue seemed a bit weird to me. If you started at Howard's house, it is possible to walk to Thomas's house in such a way that everyone you visit, including the one with the watermelons, has the same number of fruit. Now this one was pretty tricky, um, but it was able to be done. So from Howard, who has three nectarines, you go to Rochelle, who has three watermelons, Abby, who has three lemons, Stuart, who has three mangoes, and then to Thomas, who has three kiwi. Okay, I feel really good about this. It seems like the answer is pretty constrained and a lot of things that didn't seem like they would work out if it was all just random seemed to work out. So even though I wasn't totally sold on the dodecahedron idea, now I'm thinking it's good. And so let's try to get an extraction out of these matchups between the people and the house and the fruit. All right, so the most likely course of action, I think, is to use the number of fruit to index into the name. The obvious thing to check is to use these colors to match with the rows, the row of roses that we had here. Get the corresponding letters for each of these and see if that spells anything. Okay. First up, magenta. P, red, A, B. So it's not great. Yeah, I think there's something wrong here. Oh wait, look at that. Oh, we want the total to be 52. That's right, I said that apples could either be one or two. Let's see if that makes a difference. Right, that's clearly not the only problem. Yeah, it seems pretty suggestive of Peace be with you, but there's a lot of letters wrong here. First of all, a couple of them could be fixed by swapping the order here. So let me check my solution for the rows on the subject of roses. Oh. oh okay, I, I misunderstood this clue. All roses in the right half of the row appear only once in the entire row, not only once in the right half of the row. That means that the gray can't be here. All right, how do I fix this? Okay, well, that was a lot easier than the first time I did it. I don't know, maybe because I had all the rules memorized. Okay, great, peace be with you. All right, let's try it out. Great, let's stop the timer. Oh, should have gone slightly faster. Okay, very fun logic puzzle by Seth Mulhall. I thought this was a pretty solid logic puzzle and I'm pleased to see that the solution has a complete solving guide all the way through. I didn't check it, but that helps me believe that it was pretty soundly constructed. And one thing I do know is it is possible to do the entire first part without including the fruit, uh, which I was not able to do. But that makes me think it's even more solidly constructed than I thought, so that's great. The fact that it took place on the surface of a dodecahedron was very interesting. It really taxed my 3D spatial reasoning and as well as my deductive reasoning skills. That was a good twist. For some reason, the twist did not really feel like a big aha moment to me. I know it was clued by the flavor text and the fact that there are 12 people with five neighbors. I did pick up on that, but for whatever reason, it still took me a while to realize that that was the right path. Uh, this clue in particular, you can see one house from another. If 
felt like that clue made less sense on a dodecahedron than on a, when it was just houses on a street. And wondering maybe if this could have been something that made more sense on a dodecahedron. Like if it said, the magenta house is just over the horizon from the brown house. But then once you realize, oh, this means it's a very small planetoid, um, suddenly it makes sense. But like I said, the twist was clued and it was pretty cool. So um, I thought it was well done. All right, next up, day two, puzzle four, how best to write an essay. Okay, how best to write an essay. So it looks like this is a document that has undergone a number of revisions here. I've got this panel on the right, which seems to be a instance of each of these changes. It looks like two different people named Y and W are making changes. You can tell which is which by the colors on here. So I know enough about grammar that I can understand the context for all these changes. A lot of these are pretty common word usage issues like fewer rather than less, well rather than good, figuratively rather than literally. It seems like why the green person is suggesting all of the word changes. W, who is in pink, is suggesting more with punctuation and avoiding the passive voice. And it does seem like the changes on the right hand panel here just match up with the first several changes here. So I don't see anything super useful from the these boxes on the right. Just who is what, Y and W in these years, 2014 and 1999. One thing I notice is that there are a lot of split infinitives in this. To yearly write, to kindly remind, to viciously sue. So I'm going to start by pulling those out. All right, there's exactly one in each paragraph in addition to there being one in the title. So this seems to clearly point in the right direction. Yankovic White. The two characters who are suggesting these edits are named Y and W. So maybe one of them is named Yankovic, one of them is named White. Word Crimes by Rita Yankovic. This is a song about grammar mistakes. You learn the definitions of nouns and prepositions. All right, so in this case, the person who wrote the essay didn't know the definition of noun, they used preposition instead. So let's try to correlate the lyrics in this song with the edits made in the essay. You should know when it's less or it's fewer. I could care less. That gets changed here to couldn't care less. So I-T-S versus I-T apostrophe S. Yeah, that does appear here. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna try to write down all of the edits made and try to correlate them to a line in the song. Oh, when did this song come out? 2014, okay, great. So maybe Y 2014 is gonna be the ones that match this song. Possibly W 1999 is gonna be some other song by someone named White. It seems for the most part that the Y edits are from Rita Yankovic's song and the W edits are not. There's a couple of exceptions, but they're all pretty iffy. Paragraph seven, having won the lawsuit, I deposited a large sum of money in my bank account instead of a large sum of money was deposited in my bank account. That seems like I switched from passive voice to active voice, which I didn't see anything about in here. And in the case of paragraph 10, W adds an Oxford comma here, which is mentioned in the song, but it says, in the song that you can leave out the Oxford comma if you want. So I think we might still need to keep looking for what the source of these W's are. Oh, and one more thing I noticed is that every paragraph has exactly one W edit and exactly one Y edit. The Y edits that do appear in this song come from all over the place. They're not in any particular order as far as I can tell. That may let us reorder it once we, uh, once we figure it out. Let's see what we can find for White 1999 related to grammar. Hmm. Yes, of course. All right. So, um, Strunk and White is a famous book about the elements of style. Fourth edition of the elements of style came out in 1999. So maybe that's where we should look. Yeah, so fourth editions. I read this book in college, and at the time I really liked it. It's a very small, very accessible book, um, and for people who like style and grammar, it's kind of cool to see it written out like that. I have read a lot of criticism of this book over the years, but 
I think for a lot of people, it probably still has a positive association. It's one of their first introductions to the world of style. Um, it looks like it is available online. I remember in particular, there was one thing that really confused me. Yeah, the word people is not to be used with words of number in place of persons. If of six people, five went away, how many people would be left? I did not understand this. I asked a couple people and nobody could explain to me what this actually means. The saying you should never say six people, you should always say six persons. Anyway, I think that this is one example of this book just being a little bit outdated. But I think a good place to look is probably their elementary rules of usage. There's a list of rules, and I bet that some of these correspond to the edits we saw in the document. Okay, here, take this first one. Form the possessive singular of nouns with apostrophe S. And so, for instance, some people would write Charles's without the S at the end. But they say, yes, you should include the S. And we see that here with Miley Cyrus's saying to add the S to that. So that is rule number one. In a series of three or more terms with a single conjunction, use a comma after each term except the last. So this is saying to use the Oxford comma. Place a comma before and or but, introducing an independent clause. That's what this is. Okay, so this one, very complicated comma, is rule four. All right, I deposited a large sum of money in my bank account instead of a large sum of money was deposited in my bank account. It definitely just seems like active and passive, but that's not mentioned in the song. Oh, okay. So I don't know what version I was looking at, but the fourth ver fourth edition here is definitely what I need to be looking at because they include the year 1999. So this, I think, might have a slightly different ordering of the rules. Form the possessive single of nouns by adding apostrophe S. Yep, that's still rule number one. Oxford comma still rule number two. Okay, now this one's different. This rule seven did not appear in the version I was looking at. Actually, a couple of these are new. I think what's rule 11 here was rule seven before. So everything from five on, I'm going to redo. All right, this definitely looks better. There's a lot fewer Q's and K's. Debunano song. But this T could go somewhere in here. So maybe that's not too far off. Oh, okay. Yeah, I made the mistake here. So paragraph 11. Being a changed person, a friend asked me for some advice. They recommend changing it too. Being a changed person, I was asked by a friend for some advice. And this is changing from active voice to passive voice, which is not something they would normally recommend. So this must be for a different rule. In particular, they want changed person to be close to I, which I think is like keep related words together or something. Quite close to debutante, we would need to change this O to an E. Where does he say anything that suggests you should replace a large sum of money was deposited with I deposit a large sum of money? Your participle's dangling. Is this a dangling participle? Plunging hundreds of feet into the gorge, we saw you send me falls. The participle phrase, plunging hundreds of feet into the gorge, is dangling because it should refer to Yosemite Falls, but the structure makes it look like it refers to we. Is that what's going on here? Having won the lawsuit, I... Oh, it is! Okay, okay, yeah, it is. The original wording makes it seem like having won the lawsuit applies to the large sum of money, but it should refer to I. Okay, so that is a dangling participle after all. That's fine. I've Everything else needs to move up by one. Debut song with T A N O in the middle. Let's see. So these words, or these rules, which am I least sure of? So there is a musician named Tano, an Argentine thrash metal guitarist. 
What do we have for this one? Rule 20, keep related words together. Being a changed person, I was asked by a friend for some advice. Oh yeah, so this is the one that switched to passive voice. What else could it be? Oh, this is it. The participial phrase at the beginning of a sentence must refer to the grammatical subject. Being a changed person, I was asked by a friend. In the original version, a friend is the subject of the sentence. And being a changed person is a participial phrase. Okay, so this is 11. Okay, Kano was an Italo disco music project formed in Milan, Italy in 1979. Kano's debut single was the 1980 international hit, I Am Ready. All right, let's try that. No, that's incorrect. Oh. Kano was a British rapper, songwriter, and actor. This search turns up P's and Q's, which definitely is more thematic with the rest of the puzzle. Debut solo single P's and Q's. Let's try that. That's it. All right. Great. Stop the timer. Okay, solution. How best to write an essay by Anderson Wang, who was also one of the authors on Zero Space from day one, which was a really good puzzle. Um, I realized I didn't do a great job of explaining what I was actually doing here. In case you missed it, you take the rule number for the white edit, use that to get a letter of the alphabet. You take the order in the song of the Yankovic edit, and you order the letters by matching up which paragraph they were in, because each paragraph had a Yankovic edit and a white edit. So those three steps of getting a letter from a number and putting something in order in terms of where it appears somewhere else and pairing things up when they're together, those are all like second nature as you've done enough of these puzzles. That's probably why I didn't do a great job of explaining it. I just jumped right into it. So I thought this was well written. I didn't get second aid point. There was always something that I could work on. I was a little surprised that many test solvers did not see the thing with the split infinitives of the gang that spells out Yankovic white. If you've been trained to recognize split infinitives, they really stand out. And I was certainly glad that was there. It was a great way to get the puzzle started. Finally, day two, puzzle five, a glistening occasion. At the end of each puzzle ball tournament, we look back at a montage of highlights to the sound of, what song was it again? All right, this is just an image. There's no sound here. So this looks like sports trivia, but I don't know enough sports to even tell what it really is. All right, a few of these definitely look like pretty weird for sports trivia, but they could be realistic. Found one. Some say he looks a lot like Ted Cruz, but his parents don't think so. Grayson Allen's parents do not think he looks like Ted Cruz. Shooting percentages go down in this open dome. NRG Stadium. He shares his name with a former Toronto Raptors player and a current Toronto FC player. So I think the best way is probably to look down the list of Toronto FC players who were current in 2017 and see if any of them share a name with a Toronto Raptors player. All right, Michael Bradley, soccer is a current Toronto FC player. Michael Bradley Baseball is a former Toronto Raptors player. So we need another athlete named Michael Bradley. So the most recent one is this, Michael Bradley Canadian Football. This is an example of how I don't know anything about sports. I assumed that it would be unlikely to pick the bracket winner, but I guess it's noteworthy that Barack Obama missed it three years in a row. Doesn't seem like a lot. Does it even make sense to say Harvard's winningest player? Don't you have to specify what sport you're talking about? See, it's a little hard for me, as someone who doesn't really read much sports coverage, to tell exactly what they're talking about. Like, they'll use metaphors like drew first blood, 
but that just means they scored first, I think, in context. So when they say here a second half fracas, are they talking about an actual fight? So the obvious thing of taking the note number, as it appears in each of these 10 notes, and using it to index into the 10 answers here, isn't going to work, right? Because this name is too short for 13. Uh, this name is too short for 12. So if these were all athletes, then I would be writing down all sorts of stats I could find about them, like what their current team is, what year they were born, uh, what years they were playing. But the fact that uh, we have a few exceptions here, one of them is a referee, one of them doesn't even have a job in athletics, and one of them is not even a person, lets us eliminate a lot of hypotheses like that. Okay, I think I am stuck. I finished filling in these answers after about one hour, and nothing has really looked promising since then. I wrote down a few threads to consider, things that seem like they might be significant. None of those led anywhere, uh, I just noticed them. So now let's talk about what happens when I am stuck. I wrote up this solving protocol. You may request a hint if the solve time is over three hours and you've been stuck for one hour. So I think that's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to request a hint and stop the timer while waiting for the response. So I'm gonna to try to do it as close as possible to the hints that would have happened in the actual competition. So every day after the first, each team will receive two hints in the form of yes, no questions. These hints can be used on any puzzle open for at least 24 hours. Realistically, by the time I got to this one, it would have been 24 hours. So I'm gonna use one hint to ask a yes or no question. So I don't know if they still check this email. It's a few years old now. Galacticpuzzlesetters at gmail.com. But let's give it a try. I wrote out that I'm recording a solution for a glistening occasion and I'm currently stuck. I'd like to request a yes or no hint. So the question I decided to ask is, I wrote down these answers that I have, and I ask, are at least nine of the following 10 answers correct? And so if the answer is no, I'll know to look at these more closely and try to figure out what I'm missing. And maybe if I get them all right, then I will see the pattern more clearly. But if they are all right, then I need to look somewhere else. So whichever way this hint goes, I'll get something useful out of it, I think. And I decided at least nine out of 10, because if just one was off, then I probably still would be able to see any pattern that was there. Two off is enough to break a pattern, I'd say. So even if nine of them are correct, I still want to be looking somewhere else. So I think this looks pretty good. I'm gonna go ahead and send it and stop the timer. Yeah, according to the rules, I, I shouldn't be trying to solve this at all while I'm waiting for the hint. So I'll come back to this when I get a response. Okay, it's just a couple of hours later and it looks like they were back. So let's resume the timer and see what they said. One of these appears to be misspelled, not counting that yes, at least nine of the 10 are correct. Okay, that's good to know. All right, let's figure out which of these is misspelled. So I haven't figured out which one is misspelled yet, but in looking them up, I notice something that, which is at least a couple of them have nicknames. No, no, a couple of them definitely do not have clear nicknames. So one question that it would be nice to know the answer to is, is there anything else in the clue that we need? My guess is that we don't need the clue anymore. I feel like we've used up all of the clues. If we can come up with some method of sorting these, sorting the names, then we have something to try. I've tried pretty much everything I can think of. There's one thing that sort of looks like a lead, but I'm suspecting that it's not. So the title, A Glissing Occasion, makes me think of glissando, since it seems to be music themed. And a glissando is a musical term where the tone goes diagonally across the staff. And that reminded me of reading diagonally down a list of answers. The first letter of the first answer, second letter of the second answer, and so on. That didn't spell anything. And the flavor text says we look back. And so I thought, okay, what if we take the last letter from the first answer, the second to last letter from the second answer, and so on. 
And that spells this Tanya coin, which does return hits that are pretty similar to it, but I think it's mostly because there's a lot of names that are very similar to this. Tanya seems to be a common first name, and there's a lot of similar names to coin, but none of the results make me think of something thematically related to the rest of the puzzle. So I'm thinking this is dead end. It definitely looks more like an answer than anything else I pulled out. But, you know, when you look at something so many different ways, you're going to get something that by coincidence looks like a word when it's not. Okay, it's been over two hours since I got the hint. I'm still stuck in the same place. It's getting a little late here. I'm going to call it a night. Go ahead and stop the timer and I will pick it up when I resume. Okay, I have spent a few more hours on this today. I'm still stuck. I have not made any significant progress. I may go into more detail on these dead ends later, but not yet. I have tried to write up what I think would be a good hint. It's basically asking, do I need the numbers for the next step? The numbers in the musical notes. The rest of this email is clarifying exactly what I mean by that because they can't really ask for clarification without giving something away. So I'm just trying to be as precise as possible. I'm saying that if the next step can be gotten just from the title text, the flavor text, the clues, and the answers, um, and maybe something else external to the puzzle, then the answer is yes. I can make progress without using the numbers. But I suspect the answer is going to be no, that the numbers are essential. Okay, so I'm going to send this off and then I'm going to stop for the night. All right, stopping at 9 hours, 23 minutes. So whenever I want to resume this puzzle, I'll start by reading the hint and take it from there. All right, I am back. Let's go ahead and resume the timer. So it's been about two weeks since I recorded last, and I think I've done a pretty good job of putting this puzzle out of my mind. Um, but let me see if I remember where I was. So. I got the answers to all 10 questions. They were a little weird, but they all had pretty straightforward answers. And that's pretty much it. I used my first hint to ask whether these were correct. And the answer was yes, they are. Maybe one's wrong. And the second hint was whether I need the numbers that were in the musical notes in order to proceed. And I have not checked that email yet. So let's see what they said. Okay, the answer is yes. Um, so that means that there is something that I'm missing that does not have to do with the musical notes. Some pattern in these names or some fact that all of these people or places have in common. Now I had pretty much already considered everything I could think of along those lines. So even though the answer is surprising, it doesn't like immediately unstick me. Um, but now that I'm back at it, I will focus on the names or the people and put, my, put the musical notes and their numbers out of my mind for the time being. Uh, so I am at just over 12 hours, three minutes in, and I'm going to give up here. I'm just going to say a few words first about where I wound up. So on my solving protocol, I have here, you may quit if the solve time is over 12 hours and you've been stuck for one hour and you've requested at least two hints. And that's where I am. I've been stuck basically since one hour in after I got the names. Everything after that has not really led anywhere. So. 11 hours is a long time and I was, I didn't have any great ideas and I managed to completely exhaust any medium ideas I had. So I don't really feel like more time would really help me out here. I think the hints I got back were good. They just weren't good enough to get me all the way there. I've tried everything I could possibly think of. Born, died, which sport, which team, which role, which position, jersey number, Twitter handle, nickname. Tried indexing the letters in the answer every way I could think of. What do I think the solution is? I think that it's not going to be something that I thought of. Everything I thought of, I managed to check out pretty well. I've checked all my work multiple times. I suspect that there's either some piece of sports knowledge that would help me or just some other way of looking at things that I just didn't consider. I have some ideas here of things that I noticed that might have been good hints if I could follow the thread well enough, but nothing here is very clear what to do with. So I'm going to put my, go ahead and put my solve time down. So officially I am quitting right now. Anything I do from that, this point on doesn't count, but I am interested in thinking about this a little more. So just for the sake of the video, I'm going to try something. So I'm pulling up, go ahead and pulling up the solution, but before I do that, I'm going to shrink the window down a bit.
And what I'm going to try to do is read just enough of the solution to see something that I didn't already know. And then just think about the problem a little more. I may not necessarily solve it, um, but I want to see where that takes me. The title, Flavor Text, and Clues about College Basketball and March Madness suggests that a key to this puzzle is one shining moment, the song that plays it. Okay, all right, so that's enough. I already see something that I had no idea about. All right, so I've watched a number of these and I'm pretty sure I have a pretty solid hypothesis which is that every answer appears in one of these montages from some year. Found uh, Barack Obama in 2012, NRG Stadium in 2016. The ones who are basketball players are going to be a bit harder to find just because it's a three minute video and it's just shot after shot after shot, like one second clips uh, from various basketball games. Uh, but yeah, I suspect that if I watch closely, I will be able to find uh, each of the answers in exactly one year's video. And so if I do, then there's a few things I can try. I can see like what year it was, what uh, timestamp the person appears in. So I was thinking I was just gonna stop, but I think I'll spend a little more time on this. Yeah, I'm, I wanna see if I can make any progress on it. So I was able to find at least all of the basketball players in some video. I've watched all the videos from all these years a couple times each. The years are coming out of order, which is a good sign. But there are still some gaps here. These two who are football players, I have no idea what to make of them. The one who's a referee, I watched basically to make sure that he didn't appear very prominently in a shot, but there are so many shots with referees in the background, I could easily have missed him in one of these. This guy who is a coach uh, appears in at least two separate videos, so it's not completely unique. So even though I feel like I'm definitely making progress now, there are still some mysteries here and I feel like there's still a bit of work to do. I've spent over two hours after I said I was done with the puzzle looking at this and I think I'm gonna stop. I'm glad I did this. I feel like I got a good sense of what it would feel like to solve this puzzle. Um, but since I already said this isn't gonna count anyway, I feel like I've put in enough time here. So I'm gonna go ahead and look at the rest of the solution. A glistening occasion by Josh Allman. So first of all, how does this work? I didn't get to the end. It's pretty simple. We were on the right track. Uh, when you figure out the year and timestamp for each of these, you're gonna get one from each year, so 2007, 2008. And you should be able to sort by the timestamp and then index using the letters and the notes based on the new sort order. Okay, yeah, sorting by the timestamps, this comes out to scoreboard, which was the answer. So I actually got several of these wrong, which kind of surprised me because of that first hint. Uh, this one I had as a football player should have been the football mascot. Lee Jones should be Les Jones. I guess my source on that had it incorrect. I copied it from this article. Yeah, this article says Lee Jones. So that must have been the one they were referring to when they said there was a typo in one. And this one I thought was a Canadian football player apparently is another basketball player. But, like, he doesn't have a Wikipedia page, so I missed him. So I guess I would say that I was a bit overconfident that I had these right based on the first hint. It seemed like if I got nine out of 10 right that, you know, I could probably just ignore one. But the fact that I had wrong information about three of them, maybe I should have spent more time making sure I had these correct. So it's always pretty cool when you're writing the, a puzzle to get the opportunity to share your hobby with other people. Uh, this seems to be a case like that. And I think the author did a really good job with that. Having people watch these videos so closely and look for faces yeah, it really made me pay attention to the material. It's not something I could have gotten just like reading off a Wikipedia page without ever seeing the original material it was from. Yeah, I thought that was a good puzzle design. So I do want to say the construction is not flawed at all. It's not broken. But there's a couple of minor things that make it a little, you know, a little rough around the edges. Some of these people appear in multiple videos. You know, if it, everybody appeared in exactly one video, that would be like really solid construction. It's true that I was starting to pick up on the fact that there was one in each year, so it's not too bad. This guy appears twice in his video, but since the first appearance timestamp comes after this timestamp and the second appearance comes before this timestamp, it works out okay, so it doesn't matter which one you use. But again, if everybody appeared exactly once in their videos, that would be slightly more sound. 
it seems like the author was aware of these limitations, but the source material they wanted to use kind of made it a little tough. So given all that, I think it was well constructed. So I definitely want to take some time to think, why was I stuck for so long? Why did the insight that this was based on a specific song associated with basketball elude me for 11 hours? I do want to start by saying that I did search for NBA song and I definitely tried to find a song that was strongly associated with the NBA. I didn't know to search for March Madness song. Let me see what would have been the right thing to search for. Yeah, see, even March Madness song would not have turned up what I need. Okay, so March Madness montage song would have done it. So there was enough clues in the flavor text that I could have got there even with no knowledge of basketball. I just would have had to know how to read it from there, I guess. Another approach that probably would have been ideal is if I knew somebody who was pretty familiar with NBA basketball, they might have made the association if they looked at the puzzle for long enough. Obviously, the puzzle is made that you don't have to have any prior knowledge in order to solve it. So I certainly could have gotten it myself. And so that's probably the skill I want to work on ideally. But thinking through this, I guess the only way to have come across it was to just spend some time I'm not even trying to solve the puzzle, just trying to be a basketball fan for an hour and see what topics came up. Maybe I would have realized how important March Madness is, and uh, since this took place in March, maybe I would have thought to pull on that thread. Nobody knows for sure, um, and I don't really feel like there was anything obvious in retrospect to do that I didn't do. I'll definitely keep this experience in mind when I get stuck in the future. Maybe it'll help me out next time. Okay, that's it for... The five day two puzzles I was able to solve four of the five and got stuck on the fifth one. I want to say that every puzzle so far has been great and I've been enjoying it, even when I get stuck. I like that day two had some variety. Uh, what do you do and a glistening occasion were kind of standard puzzles, whereas Very Fun Logic Puzzle and How to Best Write an Essay had a little bit of a twist. Nothing was too out there. So as for the next video, continuing with day three, I am open to suggestions. Do you think I need to go into more detail or have less detail? Any particular aspects you want me to focus on? I like having a solving protocol, so I think this was a good idea. I may tweak it and I'm open to suggestions on how you think I should tweak this, but I definitely like having this in place. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time when we continue with Galactic Puzzle Hunt 2017, day three.